Bell, Tim Hodler, Gary Groff, and Kim Deitch. Thank you all for being here tonight, and here is Dan Nadell. Oh, thanks so much, Christina, and uh, thanks to all for coming. Um, tonight, we're here to uh, celebrate the Comics Journal. Uh, <laughs> us. Us, ourselves. Uh, to, <laughs> Tim and I just took over uh, editing the online journal, and um, Gary has a new issue coming out, uh, Comics Journal 301, which is going to be a 600-page mammoth, wow. uh, coming out in about a month. And right. I guess there will be copies at MoCA tomorrow, uh, some advanced copies. So we wanted to um, take the time here to talk to Gary about uh, the journal and its origins. and sensibility and Kim about being on the other side of it as an artist uh, and as somebody who's chronicled fandom and, and been involved in it. So <laughs> let's keep the conversation public, guys. Are you guys here? So uh, we wanted to start off maybe, Gary, if you could give us a little background on how the journal started, um, what you were doing. You were a uh, you were a kid involved in fandom. You'd put on a rock convention. You'd put out a music magazine. Uh, you loved comics. And, and then what happened? Um, all right. Give you the shorthand version if there is such a thing. Um, where do I start? Well, I published, when I was a teenager, I published um, a little fanzine. Um, I did that from the age of 13 to 17 or 18. I was a comics nut, um, read comics obsessively, um, collected comics, uh, read mostly mainstream comics, Marvel and DC comics. Um, and so I put out a fanzine. Then um, I had a kind of desultory and disastrous college career where I kind of burned my way through four different colleges. Um, um, I sort of um, indulged the, uh, the entrepreneurial side of me, mostly because I was temperamentally incapable of working for anybody. And if I did work for anybody, it was probably for a very short amount of time before I got fired, and probably for good reason. So um, at one point, um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, we did publish a, um, a rock fanzine for a couple of years. Um, and when I say we, I'm talking about me and um, my old buddy Mike Catron, uh, with whom I started the Comics Journal and these various other endeavors. Um, and then in 1976, because we had this vast knowledge of comics and we didn't really know what to do with it or how to, you know, how to um, make any money with this vast knowledge of comics. What we did was we essentially took over a fanzine called the Nostalgia Journal. Uh, the Nostalgia Journal was what's called an ad zine. It was primarily full of advertising with a little bit of editorial content to satisfy postal requirements. And so what we wanted to do at the time was to take it over, turn it into um, a real magazine, by which I mean uh, that it had real editorial content, because that's what we were interested in. We were interested in journalism. We were interested in criticism. Um, and we took this over in 1976 um, and slowly turned it into a real magazine. Um, you probably want to know the context of the times. and That's your next question. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, Dan can now go into the audience and I can ask myself <laughs> questions. Um, well, so, uh, the, the, the mid-70s were a really terrible time for comics. There was really nothing going on. Kim, Kim can, could give his perspective, but on well, it wasn't so bad for the underground, actually. Well, in, in, the, in the mid to late 70s? I mean, weren't the undergrounds kind of running Business out of steam? Business was terrible, but I did my best work up to that time. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I mean, there were far fewer of them. Head shops were going out of business. Oh, that's for um, sure, yeah. You know, um, I mean, underground yeah. kind of, I mean. Bottom really fell out financially in 72. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, and mainstream comics were almost just complete garbage at that time. Um, I mean, all the artists from the 1960s were either um, doing some of their, their most mediocre work um, or weren't doing work at all, um, or under such editorial restrictions they couldn't do any good work. Um, so anyway, that's when we started the Comics Journal. And our mission, I think, 
I mean, as best as I can recollect is, we, I mean, we wanted to put out a magazine that had real content and we were obsessed with making comics a legitimate art form, which in 1976, it certainly wasn't. Um, I mean, comics were off pop culture's radar. Um, there was a lot of talk at that time about comics simply going out of business, the whole industry collapsing. Um, the direct sales market, which, which were composed of comic book stores throughout the country, were, were just starting um, to build up at that time, started in the early 70s, and so there was this, this very, very small network of comic book stores at the time. Uh, but comics were being sold less and less in the outlets which they were traditionally sold in, which were grocery stores, 7-Elevens, um, places like that. Uh, and the reason for that is because they were, um, they were just not financially viable. Um, stores didn't want to sell a 20 or 25 cent product to kids who lo loitered around the store and, you know, read most of them there and didn't buy them. Um, so, uh, you know, into, into this uh, historical context um, we, we entered and, um, and our mission, I, I'm not sure if it was, I mean, I think it kind of grew over the first maybe 10 or 15 issues, but um, our mission was to, to impose the kind of criticism and the kind of journalism on the comics as an art form and, as, and the comics industry that the comics had not seen up to that time. Uh, prior to that, 99% of the fanzines were like the fanzines I did when I was a kid, which were just um, very fanish, geeky, um, um, you know, appreciative, gushing kinds of... Um, what was the name of your fanzine? <laughs> oh, man. Amazing Heroes? <laughs> no, that was... Uh, the fanzine I did as a kid, it was, it was called Fantastic Fanzine. <laughs> okay. Uh. And, and, and the first issue had a logo that I stole from the Fantastic Four that I, I, uh. I traced. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I did, I did the first one when I was 13. My, I, would, I would lay it out at home and type it on a typewriter. My dad would take it to his work and Xerox 50 copies. So it would be like 20 pages each. And, uh, and then eventually um, it, was prof it was more professionally printed um, via offset. And it, you know, it got better and better, but it, uh, you know, wasn't much right. So then who would you send the fanzines to, was it? Well, we'd sell them. Uh, what you would do back then is you would put um, a, a, like a one-inch ad in Marvel Comics. And this is how I discovered fanzines. I would, I would, if you look at the, the, the Marvel Comics in the 1960s, um, you'll see that there's a page of like little tiny ads or about a half an inch or one inch tall and fanzines would advertise in there. They were apparently, they were apparently cheap enough to advertise. Mm -hmm. And so there were a number of fanzines advertised. I sent away for them. They were like 25 cents each. You put a quarter in an envelope and send away for it. And so eventually I advertised my fanzine in this. Um, and then I got orders and that's how, that's how I sold it. When you, when you read the early issues, or <laughs> even the later issues of Comics Journal, you get the sense that people were very hostile other, me, other, other people in the community, if you can call it the community, um, were very hostile to the, the whole idea yeah. of applying yeah. critical thinking to comics. Um, so what, for, I guess, what made you think of doing it, and, uh, and why do you think they were hostile? Or? Well, they were hostile for good reason, because we were ta attacking them. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, we were, we were incredibly strident about about how, about how lousy comics were. And I mean, most of the comics then, um, you know, you can't, you can't quite say it was hack work because most of the people involved in it were really passionate about what they were doing, but it was still crap. And, um, and this was really the first time, probably the first time in the history of the medium when a regularly published periodical attacked, you know, the entire ethos of the comics industry month after month after month. And, um, you know, in short order, uh, you know, we, we, we acquired that reputation and, um, you know, we were treated accordingly by the professional community. And so but what gave you, what, what made you, why, why were you the first person to do it? Well, you know, after high school, um, I mean, I was, a, I was a comics geek, and when I was a teenager, um, I, I didn't read much more than comics. I mean, I was just obsessed with, with, with comics. 
<laughs> maybe it was movies, but I didn't read much. And in the uh, couple of years after high school, I actually managed to educate myself somewhat, um, uh, mostly um, autodidactically and not through college. But I managed to uh, I managed to come across a lot of great um, critics who were writing at the time. Um, this would have been the uh, mid '70s. And uh, as I was telling you um, um, recently, um, I had a teacher, I went, I went to a community college, one of the four colleges I went to was a com community college where I studied, um, I took a class in, in writing. And this teacher turned me on to all the magazines that were being published back then at that time, uh, who actually, which actually published great criticism. There was Esquire, uh, there was uh, New York Magazine, there was a New Yorker, um, there was Moore Magazine. And um, Esquire, for example, published was publishing Dwight McDonald on film. I think it I think it published Jeffrey Wolf on fiction. Uh, published Nora Ephron on media when she was writing well. Um, and they just had a great lineup. And they were I mean they weren't all as literary as someone like Dwight McDonald who was who was fantastic. But they were all smart and they were all savvy. And this was a whole new world to me. And I, I and what it did was it taught me how to make distinctions about art and what art actually could mean, um, you know, the mission, as it were, of art. And, uh, and then from there, I mean, I just, you know, started buying um, books of criticism and educated myself about what, what art could mean, how good it could be, uh, how meaningful it could be, what it could mean in your life. And, and that's why I wanted to apply those standards to comics. So, Kim, to yeah. bring you into this a bit. Right. Um, so where do you fall in all of this? I mean, by the, by the mid '70s, you had been doing underground comics for almost a decade. Um, yeah, and uh, you were a fan of comics as Definitely. a kid and all the way through. Yes. Were you looking for this kind of uh, writing about comics? Was did it appeal to you at all, or or was did it was it sort of beside the point? Well, I was looking for the main chance in terms of getting publicity, and so naturally, when, when the opportunity presented itself to be interviewed by Comics Journal, I went way out of my way to be cooperative and see that that happened. Is that right? Well, yeah. Why wouldn't I? I mean, I'd be, uh, some kind of a screwball not to. You know, and I enjoyed Comics Journal, and I enjoyed reading the things that Gary wrote, sticking it to various people. I guess Will Eisner seemed to be who you were really going after he was about the time I uh, started reading Comics Journal. I just, I, just, I just wrote a single critique of Will Eisner. But really? Yeah, I know. In <laughs> my mind, it seems it like, like I spent an, an entire lifetime uh, assaulting poor Will Eisner, but no, it was just uh, a single piece that I wrote. And I, you know, I got hooked on reading it. I loved to read the interviews, especially of the old timers, and it didn't even necessarily have to be somebody really well known. I think some of the, the best ones I read were of people that, you know, weren't necessarily all that well known at all. You know, I mean, so, yeah, I enjoy, you know, when, you know the period of Comics Journal that I loved the best, I would say was not its last incarnation, but the incarnation just before the last, when you started putting in something in color and collectible mm. in every issue, and I mean, so suddenly, <clears throat> They became real collector's items, and I still have those. Like you know, some obscure piece of Harold Gray that I'd never seen right. before, right. Or, or a reprint of a weird picto fiction book by Matt Baker, and uh, or Our Gang by Walt Kelly. Right. All those were great, and I was really sorry when that. I guess the the economy <laughs> just wasn't, uh, wasn't well, supporting I'm gonna, that. I'm going to take that uh, as a marketing tip. But, but no, <laughs> those, to me that was the golden age of Comics Journal. <laughs> Huh. <laughs> well, well, what would you say? I mean, uh, yeah, what would you say? <laughs> yeah, what do you say, Dan? About what? <laughs> well, the well, you know, if I could, no, go ahead. No, I, I mean, for me, the, the journal uh, and the, what, what I found most appealing about the journal was really, I guess, in the late 80s and through the mid 90s, which was a kind of pretty intense period of long interviews with artists. Yeah, they were and great. And very counterintuitive and really, really smart criticism by like Carter Schultz and uh, Dale Luciano.